Harry Brundage. Harry leads the performance team at Shopify, focusing on making computers go fast while also making sure that they don't break. Here this morning to show us how to manage state and thick client apps, please welcome Harry Brundage. Morning, everyone. My name's Harry. I used to program JavaScript for a living. Still do sometimes. I really like it, it's fun. So I'm glad you guys are all here today to talk about some cool parts of it. I'm gonna start today with an inspirational series of quotes, hopefully to kick off the day with a bang. Number one, uh, complex GUI programming is like so totally easy. Number two, memory leaks are like so totally that much fun to debug. And number three, wow, my massive JavaScript MVC app leaks memory like fucking Niagara Falls. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's me about a year ago. Um, I think it's like super, super easy, if not way too easy, to leak memory in JavaScript apps. Uh, there's tons of different reasons why, but it just happens a lot. And uh, I guess I just want to talk about why that happens today and like what we can sort of do to avoid that. Hold on just a second, sorry. So in the past, I think a lot of us were, uh, like me, jQuery jockeys. We wrote like uh, a whole bunch of JavaScript that executed in the document ready event and set up a bunch of event handlers, like maybe it was cool Java or jQuery live events on the body or whatever. But it was like this big batch that executed at the start, usually for progressive enhancement or something like that. Uh, there's not much more after that. If you wanna look at like the memory profile of an application like this over time, it starts with a bunch of stuff that gets allocated at the start for a bunch of event handlers or whatever, spikes up, and then as the user scrolls around and pokes around, not much changes, not much is being, uh, is being fetched or allocated or whatever. Um, the interesting part is that as the user navigates, it jumps back down to zero. We throw out the whole VM context, right? We effectively reset the whole page. The world dies. Uh, so let's say the user loads up the next page, same thing, maybe it's a different JavaScript, maybe it's different data, whatever. Uh, clicky, 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 again, the world resets, dies. So on the third page load here, for example, let's say the user uh, does something that leaks some memory. So we like increase uh, what's been allocated during the timeline of this particular page. Again, the world just dies, right? The user navigates away onto their next page, switches tabs, whatever. We get this kind of like reset effect where it doesn't matter if we leak memory that much. There's a time box on the amount of time that the memory leak can be, have an effect. Whereas in JavaScript MVC world, where we're doing navigation within the same VM, if the user uh, visits one page and then visits the next page, the memory doesn't change. We're still in the same context. We don't get that reset effect. If they navigate to another page where we load up some JSON or pull in some new data, the memory just goes up, right? Um, on the game, that third page, if we do something shitty and we leak memory, it's like persistent. It never goes away. We don't get that reset effect unless the user is smart enough to like refresh because they notice their app is slow or something like that. So if you ask me, leaks were kind of okay back in the day. I mean, still totally less than ideal, but uh, now the whole session suffers. So we don't, we don't have that fail safe of the user navigating all the time. I wanna point out just a very specific example that's burned me like a whole bunch of times. So jQuery in, in uh, particular has this cool thing called the data API. It allows you to attach an arbitrary piece of data to a random node in your DOM for a retrieval later. So here we're saying on the document body element, under the foo key, store the uh, number 52, under the bar key, store the word test, and then retrieve the foo key and we get 52 out. So it's just like uh, setting properties or something like that on the node. The reason that you use this really weird sort of syntax with all these arguments and this kind of thing is uh, to be memory safe. So. One might think that you could just take the node or like a, a variable that, can, that uh, points to a node and set a property on it. Like in this bottom example here, I'm saying node.sum property equals some data. So IE, all of our favorites, has this problem where in versions less than nine, if you attach data in a, like an object to a node under a property and that data has a reference to the node, that creates a circular reference between the node and the data and that won't ever get garbage collected, ever. It's just like stupid, it's just a bug. So jQuery has like a fun little hack workaround where instead of storing the data on the node, it stores it in what they call a global cache. It's literally jQuery.cache. It's an object with a bunch of properties for each node. So what happens is on the node, we assign an ID. It's just like a number. And then whenever we go to look up the data for the node, we look in the cache at that number and spit out an object. 
So jQuery sort of manages this like lookup table of IDs to data for us to work with. And that's cool because it breaks the circular reference. There's no thing on the node which references the node. There's just a thing on the node which references something else in like a lookup table. So that's great, but there's a catch. And it's that that cache needs to be emptied when the node leaves the DOM. If you're changing the nodes that are in the DOM, and you're adding new data to new nodes, and you're removing old nodes, the data for those nodes lives in jQuery's cache, not on the nodes, which means that it's like referenced, and the garbage collector is like, oh, well, this is just an object that's like referenced from the root, so I'm not going to get rid of it, which means that if you want that data to be deleted, and you want a consistent memory profile, you need to use jQuery's fun cleanup methods. You can't just be like document, or like, uh, remove child on a parent node or something like that. You need to tell jQuery to remove it. So the jQuery remove function has a bunch of functionality to go through and clean up the data, clean up event handlers, sort of like clean up all the stuff that's memory unsafe that it does. So that's all well and good, but I forget to do this all the fucking time, <laughs> like really often. Um, I would like to just use my normal DOM manipulation methods, or I would like to use my plugins that use normal DOM manipulation methods. Hopefully my th stuff's built on top of jQuery and uses the right jQuery primitives, but in the event that someone forgets or someone like it slips past code review or whatever, you can just end up with memory leak. And again, in the old world, that's not the end of the world, right? There's a time box on how long that jQuery cache lives, and every page load, there's a new cache instance booted up, and we don't really like pay the price. It's not disastrous. Now, we're in a different world. I would say like a different era entirely. So this is Shopify, which is the company I work for. This is our like, administration interface where store owners change their orders and products and stuff like this. And the sessions for this application are measured in like the hours sometimes, not always, but it's like Gmail, right? You pin it in a tab and you never sleep your computer and so it's always there. Like usually what ends a session is you closing your browser hard or something like that. So like memory, or consistent memory profiles for apps like Shopify and apps like Gmail, the things that people live in are really, really important. And if someone forgets to jQuery.remove something, the whole session pays the price. Um, so I just want to do a little brief detour and talk about JavaScript GC. I think there's a bunch more info on this coming later in the day, but uh, I just want to do a brief rundown. So the heap where all JavaScript objects are stored is a graph. It's a graph of objects that reference other objects. So a reference can be like a key on an object that points to another object, it can be uh, a closure scope, it can be a whole bunch of different things, but the idea is that it's this, it's this graph. And then uh, a GC pass is a pass over the heap, which looks at every single object in the heap, usually, and uh, checks to see if there's a path from one of what's called the GC roots to that object. It considers every object and checks for a path through the graph to the object. If there is a path, if you can traverse the graph from the root to the object, keep the object, and if you can't, then get rid of it. It's no longer referenced. The no user code can get at it, so there's no point of keeping it. Um, the roots in JavaScript are like a few things. Usually in the browser, it's like the window object. Everything comes from the window object. Uh, there's a couple other ones that I usually forget. In Node.js, like the global object is one of the roots. Um, yeah. And so the other thing about JavaScript GC is that detached DOM trees suck. If you've done any uh, memory leak profiling in JavaScript, you'll notice, uh, or in Chrome in particular, they have this thing where in the heap snapshotter, the thing that tells you like what's taking up space in the heap, there's this thing that they call a detached DOM tree, and they usually are all the memory leak space. It's like a tree of nodes that's somehow referenced from one of the roots, but not actually in the DOM. So it's like uh, someone set a property on a, a model or a controller which references a node that then retains that whole tree, but it's not actually in the DOM, it's not actually serving any purpose. So detached DOM trees are the thing to sort of look out for. Um, I want to do one quick example just to make sure that this is all clear, because I'm going to talk about it a lot later. Uh, this is some shitty jQuery code, I admit, but uh, a great way to leak memory. So what we have here is a selection for all the ULs on the page, all the unordered lists, loop over and execute this inner function. Inside the inner function, we say for every list element inside that UL, uh, attach a click handler, and then when the click handler fires, slide up the UL element. Just like a simple animation to get rid of my UL when any LI is clicked. I don't know why exactly you do this, but I was in a hurry last night. Um, so what's happening here is we have an outer function and an inner function. The inner function is the click handler that, gets, that happens on the event, and the outer function is this like loop function that uh, executes sort of once synchronously at the start of the page load or whatever. The outer function defines that variable element, and the inner function references it. 
the inner function gets attached as a click handler to the li elements by jQuery. It loops over all of them and says document dot add event listener blah 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 blah. And what this means is that inner function, the function li elements slide up, is uh, referenced by the nodes it's attached to. The nodes retain that function because that function is an event listener. The browser has no idea when the click event's going to fire, so it has to keep that function around to be ready to do the action whenever the click happens. The only time that the browser can successfully garbage collect that inner function is when the, the whole DOM is being deconstructed, like page unload, or when the element is definitely off screen and never referenced again. The whole point of this example is that that element variable also is retained by the inner function. So the li node retains the event uh, handler, and the event handler retains the outer element, ul element. It's kind of fucked up, but what's happening here is the closure scope of the inner function acts as a retainer for things outside the inner scope, for the lexical scope it's called. So every closure actually maintains a dictionary of all the keys and values that it can access, and it's a retainer for those too. So event handlers are big time traps for retaining stuff that you didn't mean to. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that uh, mark and sweep garbage collectors, like the kind shipped in every modern browser, take more time the more memory has been allocated. They're order n with regards to heap size. Uh, lots of the new VMs do smart stuff like generational garbage collection to like sort of dance around this fact, but the point is that the more memory you have, the longer the GC pauses are, and the longer the GC pauses are, the more unresponsive your browser is. So the reason why memory leaks suck is because they make the browser unresponsive and then they make your users unhappy, and that's because of the uh, algorithmic runtime properties of the garbage collector. So all this being bummers, I have one more thing, one more inspirational quote rather. Uh, at Shopify, where I work, we do this thing called hack days. It's like uh, Google's 20% time or whatever. We just take the two days every quarter. You work with a team that you've never worked bef with before. You have to only really loosely justify what you're working on. You can do pretty much whatever you want. And one guy, last hack days, decided to rewrite the client for the company-wide chat app that we use. We all sit on chat every day and talk to each other. He decided to rewrite the, a, a client for the company chat app in like native code in Objective-C, partly because he wanted to learn but partly because the company chat app that we use starts with a 50 meg memory profile and by the end of the day can hit a gig. It leaks memory like a fucking colander. It's like straining pasta where bytes just fall out. The it's insane. Like it's absolutely insane. Unless you're really careful, it can get really, really bad. And so like I find myself just refreshing this app all the time because it's just so freaking frustrating to use. Whereas Gmail, like I just have confidence in. So. Uh, Hopefully, someone from the Flowdoc dev team is here and will get inspired. Yeah. I want to talk about how to fight all this stuff. Um, how can we systematically ensure that memory doesn't get leaked? And what sort of ways can we think about it uh, in such a way that we can maybe program ourselves to do a better job? So, <laughs> I used to think that uh, Coco was for losers. <laughs> I was totally dumb. Um, Coco is like the uh, Objective-C, or the iOS and Mac OS X development uh, group of frameworks to build apps for your iPhone or your OS X computer. And they have this thing called View Did Disappear, which we're gonna get to in a minute. But the point is that other people have been down this path before. As JavaScript developers, we're not really the pioneers of UI programming, right? Like, we get to stand on the shoulders of giants who spent 40 years working this shit out. Um, so yeah, so I wanna talk about Objective-C and iOS. They have this thing called uh, the view lifecycle. A view is just any object that's responsible for drawing a small part of the page or even none of the page on an app or whatever. But the point is, is that as a view moves through uh, your phone and that it like, gets shown to you and then it disappears as you do something else, um, it goes through the, what they call these lifecycle events. So at the start, there's the load phase where the view gets booted up and uh, gets taught about what it's about to do. There's the appearance phase where it actually gets shown on the screen and can set up a bunch of stuff that it needs for actually working. And then there's the disappearance phase where it gets destroyed and everything goes away. Um, these things are actually the names of callbacks that uh, UIKit, the thing that renders views, will actually call on your view so you can do stuff. Um, let's look at a quick example. So. A very common pattern is to change your view's shape or look when the keyboard gets shown on an iPhone. 
the keyboard slides up and takes up a bunch of the screen, so maybe you want to compress the upper view or highlight a field or do something. In any case, you have to ask the OS to notify you when the keyboard slides up so you can do stuff. So let's say in the view's appearance callback, the view will appear callback, we ask this thing called the notification center to add an observer on the UI keyboard did show notification. And that says, Mr. Notification Center, please ping me back when the keyboard shows. Uh, that whole like selector jazz is saying call a method foo on the view. So this is cool, right? This means that like we now have this like little link into the system-wide event bus that'll tell us when stuff happens and we can slide the keyboard up or we can do stuff to our view when the keyboard shows up in the foo method. From what I understand, I'm not an iOS programmer myself, but from what I understand that this code by itself is fucking horrid. It's like really bad. All iOS programmers will reject this encoder view because you don't have this part, which is the unattach. The view must get rid of its observers when it leaves the screen because otherwise the notification center through the observer will retain the view. And every view you see, that every, you pop, or every view you pop onto the stack will never get garbage collected because there's a retaining path from the notification center through the observer onto the view. So this is correct code. This is just wrong. It, like, there's no, there's no, oops, you forgot. It's just like flat out wrong. And it's a little bit different, admittedly, because they run in such memory constrained environments. It's a little bit different because like iOS programmers have to care about manual memory management a lot more, and it's just sort of a more forefront concern. But the point is, is that uh, they have these like quality hooks as exposed by the framework, and like good conventions in the community for making sure that that stuff happens. So let's look at the equivalent example in JavaScript. We're attaching an event handler, let's say in document ready or whatever, on some uh, click thing. We uh, do some cool function in the event handler. And the equivalent to view did appear in uh, jQuery land is the document ready event, right? What's the disappear event? There isn't really one, right? Like, like for the whole document, there's a document unload event, but no one ever does anything in it. Like you don't need to, right? The whole page is about to get thrown out. Like, we're not really trained to care about the exit transition of our page because the whole thing just gets tossed. So as I was saying before, like the thing that you actually have to do is remove the elements, but again, it's not really worth it because, well, the whole thing's about to get tossed. That changes, again, when we enter the JavaScript MVC world. If there's like a dispatch function which renders the whole DOM, be it with Backbone or Batman or Ember or whatever, when we attach this thing, we need to somehow remove it before the next dispatch. Uh, it's now on us to properly model and execute the exit sort of state. Excuse me. Um, this is easy for, to forget, right? We never had to do this before, really, unless you've done programming in these other sort of UI frameworks where it's absolutely critical. It's not that it's not like it really occurs to me or to you that much, and it certainly didn't to me for a very long time. So the way to fix this, if you ask me, is to start thinking about nodes, models, controllers, views using this life cycle mental model to say, when I consider this object, I consider how it comes into being, but I also consider how it dies. And everything has an enter and an exit. Um, it's a bit of a subtle paradigm shift, but I really think it's like the most important thing, I have to say. So if there's one takeaway, that's it. Um, it took me like a year of battling memory leaks to sort of internalize this, that from the get-go, embracing the fact that there's an enter and an exit is uh, really important. The other thing, too, to consider is that for server-side developers, this is a pretty stark shift, right? Like, uh, in Rails and in PHP, you construct the whole world at the start of every request, right? You assign instance variables, you go fetch your stuff from the database, and at the end, the whole thing is tossed again. Like, uh, in Rails, it's super clear, right? You assign instance variables in your controller, and you don't even care about what happens, right? You kind of, like, make a mess, and then the framework cleans it up for you every single time. There's no, like, state about the controller. There's no global state or whatever. It's all passed on to like the persistent database or whatever that's just across the network. So in the way that HTTP is stateless, we kind of exploit that to inside the framework to just toss out stuff all the time. So again, for me, as a server-side dev and as a jQuery jockey, this was like kind of hard. The most important part about all this is that once we start thinking about things as a life cycle, we can actually pass it on to the framework to do it. So I think frameworks should handle the life cycle stuff for us as best they can. Um, by thinking about it, we promote proper thinking, but it also means we can kind of encode those standards in frameworks. Uh, frameworks can systematically ensure that these callbacks happen all the time. They can make sure that they happen in like the right order. They can handle the hard cases surrounding asynchrony and like half-rendered stuff and weird things like that. 
And the best part is that a framework, since it's shared code, gets exposed to way more surface area, right? Like a bunch of people use it, and a bunch more bugs get fixed, and we all get to kind of share the community's sort of efforts to make this thing better. We get the battle-testedness, which is really cool. So let's look at some examples of frameworks attempts at this. Um, this is from the Backbone docs. Uh, this is view.remove. So they, they added a remove method to their view. It came in like the fourth or fifth version out of you know, 30. So they had it really early, which is cool. And what view.remove does in Backbone is it says, okay, remove my element from the DOM and then unbind any event listeners that the view might attach. Backbone views have a cool syntax for declaring I want a bunch of events attached to my view. And this does a good job and cleans them all up. To me, though, this is not really good enough. It's kind of like the same jQuery thing. You have to ask the view to remove itself. You have to tell it to do so. That's because Backbone doesn't impose any sort of render pipeline or anything on you. Um, but the onus is still on the developer or on the application code to call view.remove, which isn't quite good enough if you ask me. Let's say that we want to do like nested views, where there's a parent view that manages a bunch of child views, that manage grandchild views or whatever. You have to implement that tree traversal yourself. You have to define what order you recurse that tree in, like what search algorithm you use, I guess, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's also inefficient if you do it that way, right? Like ideally, if we're removing a huge tree of views, we could go through and remove all the data, go through and remove all the event listeners, and then do only one DOM touch and remove the tree at its root. Instead, if you do this like backbone.remove, it'll call remove on all the bottom elements and do a bunch of DOM touches and then up the next level DOM touches, and it's just slow and inefficient for no real reason. Um, this is a screenshot from the Ember docs. Looks a little familiar. So we have the did insert element and the will destroy element callbacks as inspired by, I think, the Coco callbacks. And uh, to be honest, in Batman, we had things named similarly to this at one point as well. But the point is that Ember, one, seizes control of the whole DOM, and two, exposes these hooks with like the well-defined enter and exit state transitions for you to do the stuff that you need to do it. Um, they're explicitly set up for you to be able to manage the stuff that you need to. The other important part is that Ember kind of manages the view lifecycle. It's the one that adds views to the DOM and removes views from the DOM, not the developer, not the, like the controller code. Um, for us, this is kind of a bummer, right? Like I would like the flexibility to render a view into wherever I want. I would like to be able to do it at, at whatever moment I want and not be subject to Ember's like conventions and APIs and weird asynchronous run loop and this kind of stuff. But it turns out that sacrificing that flexibility is the way that we systematize good behavior. Ember can enforce the callback or the execution of these callbacks because they define an API that allows them to do so. And then we also get to benefit from their sort of rock solid implementation of the whole thing. Uh, as a good example, Ember supports that child view stuff I was talking about. You can have an Ember sort of view hierarchy where there's parent view, has a bunch of child views that it renders, it has a bunch of nested child views. And when you call the remove thing, it does the efficient thing and like executes all the callbacks in the tree and then does the one DOM touch and everything is happy and wonderful and great. Way to go, Ember. Um, yeah. So with the heavyweights, as I like to call them, the big ass frameworks, we kind of surrender control in order to get good enforcement of the life cycle. And the most important thing about that too is that once we've surrendered control, Ember can do the boring stuff. For the things that it implements, like bindings, uh, like all the sort of template rendering that it does, it can manage the proper exit transitions. We don't even have to care. You don't have to write the enter or the exit. You just let Ember do its thing. And because it can kind of ensure to itself that it's going to do the proper DOM removal and uh, sort of enter and exit transitions, we only have to implement the stuff which is kind of outside their cycle. Like we add our jQuery plugin or whatever and uh, glam stuff up when a human's required and let Ember do the rest of the work. And it turns out that's pretty rare. Um, so this is a piece of uh, a Batman HTML template. So Batman is a JavaScript MVC framework that we wrote at Shopify that powers our administration interface that I really like. I spent a lot of time working on it. Um, and this is what the templates look like. So we use HTML, HTML attributes as directives for Batman. We tell Batman to do stuff using those data dash star attributes. And what this is is a description of how to build a table to Batman says, create a TR element for every order in the orders array. And then in a column, make an A element that, has a, that will show the order uh, when it gets clicked and bind the inner text of that uh, A element to the order.number property. And then in the other column, bind it to the customer name or whatever. Um, I'm going to explain what the shit of binding is for anyone who doesn't know. This is an example of a binding. 
it's on an input element with a text type, and that data bind thing is really the only special thing. What it says is, Batman, please make sure that uh, the JS object, the product dot title, and the input always stay in sync, and that if one changes, the other changes too to reflect that. So uh, this input, if someone types into it, Batman will update the JavaScript land object to reflect what they've typed, and if someone changes the JavaScript or a piece of code changes the JavaScript land object, it'll change that value uh, attribute on the uh, input element. There's going to be a bunch more to uh, talk about this stuff, I think, in the Ambular, uh, Angular and Ember presentations. Uh, but this binding thing is just that. It binds uh, a DOM level or a DOM land property to a JavaScript land property. Um, the best part about bindings, if you ask me, and the best part about sort of Batman's like uh, uh, syntax for declaring them, is they are nothing but descriptions. All it is is a, like a description of the way that we want the world to be, and not a description of actually how to get the world like that. It's a de declaration about uh, like uh, uh, a desired reality as opposed to a like procedure for making that reality, and that's really cool because it removes any power from the developer to screw up the procedure. Batman does the procedure, and I think correctly most of the time, and uh, leaves, no, leaves no opportunity for us to get it wrong or to forget to remove observers that it adds or whatever, right? Batman adds observers on the JS land property and on the DOM, and it does the sync. And then Batman, since it's the one that manages the exit transition of these nodes, it knows exactly what observers it made, and it can have battle-hardened tested code that makes sure to get rid of all that stuff. That's really cool. It does it systematically and hopefully correctly every time. So bindings let the framework manage the view hierarchy completely, and then the life cycle of the nodes in that view hierarchy. This is kind of a contrived example, but bindings are really, really cool. I heard of a framework once that implemented a user land reference counting garbage collector for data objects based on bindings. What this is, is they say every time someone binds to an object, increment a reference count on that object. Every time someone unbinds to the object, decrement a reference count to that object. So if you have your like, list of like, uh, products or whatever, and a bunch of reference counts on them, every so often you could loop over that products and like, dereference any that have a reference count of zero. They implemented a like, user land GC for their uh, model objects so that they could like, keep a bound on the growth of their like, list of products they had in memory, which is crazy and probably hor horridly inefficient and not really that necessary now that computers have you know, terabytes of RAM in them, but uh, they did it anyways, and it's only possible because they controlled the whole sort of binding lifecycle inside the framework. <sighs> yeah. Um, so the, to the point about all this stuff, frameworks are cool, but the frameworks have to be cool, if you ask me. Um, you sacrifice some stuff. Uh, in Batman's case, often you sacrifice performance. Um, we need to support some sort of API for like figuring out when stuff changes in JavaScript land so that we can propagate that change to the DOM. And in our case, we chose to use getters and setters. So you actually, you actually have to call a function to retrieve the property of an object instead of just saying like object.key. Um, that's a little bit slower, right? Like we have a function call involved, we have this like string to allocate. In the case of a key path, like if these nested gets, we have to do some sort of recursion or something to hop down the list. Whereas like in vanilla JavaScript or in uh, some of the other frameworks, you don't have to do this, this uh, function calling at all. You just call the properties. That's better for the VM for optimization. Uh, there's no string to allocate. It's just like better. So frameworks have these trade-offs, right? Um, what they do bring also though is sort of like collective knowledge too. So uh, Batman has this like arbitrary data uh, attachment to nodes functionality as well, right? We need to keep track of event listeners that we've attached to a node and all this kind of stuff. So we have batman.data just like jQuery has jQuery.data. And uh, it turns out that most of our Shopify users, the principal client of Batman, don't use IEs less than nine, so our browser support is IE nine and up, which means that we don't have to do that stupid dance to get around the circular reference shit that everyone else does. So we can actually store data right on the node. We don't have to use this global cache, and we don't have to do the ID lookup. And this is cool. We haven't actually made this change to Batman yet because we're still testing to make sure. But the point is, is that uh, the framework kind of change under your feet to make things better, right? As browser support gets there and as people come up with new ideas and faster ideas and performance optimizations, the framework gets to sort of build that up. Um, in the case of Batman, this example is particularly pertinent because it's like a systematic uh, uh, sort of preemptive protection against memory leaks. If you accidentally remove a node using the wrong function and you don't let the cleanup logic run that does all the data removal and this kind of stuff, 
in the old way, the cache would still have the uh, entry for that object and still have a bunch of data that potentially retains the node anyways. But if you don't, uh, if you, in this case, if you do use your like normal DOM node removal methods, then the data is right on the node and can be part of the same like disjoint piece of the graph that does get garbage collected. So it means that even if you do make a mistake, it's less likely to leak, and that's really cool. Um, Batman can kind of protect you from yourself, which is weird. Um, so in summary, things begin life and things also end life, and you can use frameworks to remind you of that and help you to sort of systematize that. Uh, thanks. <laughs> so, I'm pretty sure I have a bunch of time left, and I really like answering questions. So please, please ask me questions. Nobody? Anybody? I know it's a little early. Go ahead. Sorry, I came in late. Didn't realize it. But uh, what other dependencies does Batman have? So the question is, what other dependencies does Batman have? Um, Batman can run by itself, like it could be the only script tag in your browser, or you can uh, teach about jQuery, and it'll use some of the cool stuff that jQuery has built in and uh, uh, end up at a slightly smaller file size, but it's pretty much independent. Oh, and ES5, so you need like the ES5 shim or something like that. I think there was one in the back back there. Maybe I missed. Yep. I think it's eight, IE8 eight and lower, I think, yeah. Um, it, the the specific version's in the jQuery docs, I think. Yeah. Anybody else? James? <laughs> Nerd. It does, it does. Uh, we don't, we let model memory use grow unbounded because by the end of like an hour long session, it's all of a megabyte. Um, so the, the question was, does Batman have this thing called the identity map? And so bindings pose a very unique challenge uh, to a lot of things because they allow you to kind of separate where your data lives and how the DOM reflects that. Um, but the point is, is that if you have two outlets for a particular piece of data, let's say we have like a list of orders on the screen and then a count of that orders or those orders that match a particular state on a different point on the screen, we can actually bind to the same set of source data and then have the AJAX call update the source data and have both places reflect that. The problem is if you have two bindings to the same object, you better, better be sure that it's actually the same object, like the same instance in memory. If you have two like uh, objects representing the same product with the same ID, you can have one binding messing with one and that not reflecting somewhere else. So we use this thing called the identity map in Batman, which as objects come into Batman's sort of uh, control, we check to see if we already have an object that represents this incoming object and merge the two, if so. So we only really, we try to keep only one instance of an object around so that bindings bind to the actual same object instead of different ones. And that, uh, that means that we need some list of all the objects we've ever seen so we can pull out the one that matches any incoming objects, uh, and that means that that's just one big memory leak. So everything I've said is a lie. <laughs> yeah, Agatha. Indeed, indeed. So the question was, is remove the right way to get rid of a DOM element uh, safely, I think? And yeah, but the, the, uh, the second part was that, what if you don't want to remove the whole HTML as well, and you just want to get rid of event handlers? In which case, yeah, you can just use off, the, like the jQuery opposite to on. Um, and th that works well too. If, like, if you want to get rid of data around a node, like the jQuery.data attached data, which is actually where jQuery stores event handlers, uh, you have to use the remove method. I don't think there's any way to clear data, or a, at least in the public API. Maybe there is. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Yeah. Excellent question. Uh, let me begin my 17-part thesis on the subject with a short introduction. Um, in this situation specifically, I would use something procedural to fetch the element that I actually cared about. 
So in the inner function, I would navigate to the UL using jQuery traversal methods. I'd use like closest, li.closest UL. And that way, it's just a function on the element that gets passed into the click handler, and you get, get out of this pure thing. There is no like retainment at all. Um, to be honest, like this thing is actually fine. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, innately leak memory. You just have to make sure that uh, you're not actually closing over something that you planned to have like uh, garbage collected some other way. So uh, a good programming style is to use sort of procedural stuff and keep your retaining your list of things retained by a closure as low as possible. But m like mostly, it's just important to be aware that that can be a thing. Thanks. Totally, totally. So you could use uh, like jQuery's live thing, which is kind of deprecated, and now just use on. So you attach one event handler at the top of the tree that has a scope, like it only applies to a, a selector that actually uh, sort of specifies which elements in the tree can actually fire the handler. And if the top of the tree is like your body, then you never really need to get rid of the event handler unless the, what it needs to do changes or whatever. But uh, jQuery 1.9, I think the whole event delegation stuff it brought is really cool for exactly this reason. James? You're, you're, yeah, you're right. I think up until like a year ago, V8 actually started optimizing away the dictionary that the closure like can reference and getting rid of it. Have you ever had that thing where you like, yeah, I guess we're still bound by the lowest common denominator, right? Like whatever shitty VM doesn't do that. But uh, have you ever had that thing where in Chrome, if you stick a debugger in an inner function and you reference a variable outside that inner function scope that totally should be referenceable but isn't? that's getting bit by VM's, or V8's optimization of outer closure variables away that aren't referenced in the inner function. If you use like any square brackety string access or eval or anything like that, all bets are off, and it has to keep the whole thing. But simple things like this, it's smart enough. Sorry, I saw some more hands. Yeah, what's up? Um, good question. So, no, you have virtually no control over when the GC runs, at least in normal browsers. In Node, it's a little bit different story because like, you can make C++ plugins or whatever. Um, but uh, no, you have largely no control over when it runs or how fast it runs or anything like that. Uh, what you can do is use APIs that are like, well suited to it. So if you're trying to do animations, like seamless animations, use request animation frame, which is like an HTML5 API for giving the browser an opportunity to do GC instead of set interval, which will like tick a particular draw function. So there are like APIs that let the browser pause or like consume less power or whatever, but really the only thing you have control of is how much memory you allocate and how much you're able to, or how much you dereference such that it can be garbage collected. Sorry. <laughs> Just one more point on that subject too. Uh, H or ECMAScript 6 is bringing this thing called the weak ref. You guys heard of weak refs? It's really this really interesting thing where you can have an object with a bunch of keys that reference a bunch of other objects, but the object is in a retainer for those other objects. So when you access a key on a weak ref, it uh, can return undefined or the object that used to be there, but you don't actually know what it's going to spit back out at you. It's completely up to the browser to see whether or not the objects referenced by the weak ref are referenced by any, obje any other objects, and the weak ref won't be the last retaining reference to that thing. So that's really cool, because you could use that weak ref object for jQuery's cache, right? If the cache were weak ref, then any nodes that left the DOM would have no references to their data, and the cache wouldn't be a reference to that data, so that data could just fly away, and the browser would be smart enough to notice that, oh, it's only a weak ref, let's, let's get rid of it. But uh, weak refs are actually a super prominent um, concept in iOS development. They have the, like every single pointer is declared as either a strong reference or a weak reference such that you can kind of track um, the retaining trees very manually and it's very explicit. Um, anybody else?
please. No? Okay. Thanks very much for having me.